Okay, so another question and answer session and an update generally. So uh, uh, people will get to know that when they tick onto these, they're going to get more than just the answers to the questions. So uh, there's a bit of a thing going on with Tapio. Uh, sorry, with um, uh, with Abolish at the moment. Um, he has some uh, issues, their uh, health issues, and uh, that'll be discussed later this week. So he's not able to sail the boat as well as he could or would prefer. Um, and he's uh, just sailing safe for the moment while he... Uh, recovers from that and uh, as I say it's uh, that's what's going on you know people are looking and, and seeing uh, Kirsten rocketing along the bottom and think wow that's cool but um, yeah Abolish has a few challenges right now uh, we're in touch with everyone everything's fine it's not a drama it's uh, you know it's just a particular health issue and uh, it'll resolve itself we're sure but for now he's under sailing the boat. Um, there's some interesting questions in this lot. We didn't have many questions a couple of days ago and all of a sudden they just popped up. So there's going to be some fun with these answers and uh, I'll get straight into it. Uh, Tapio totally rebuilt his boat. Why not allow newly built boats that will be less work and cost? Anyone can build a brand new Rustler. Uh, the Cape George 36 moulds are being flashed up now with requests to build new boats. Uh, possibly for the GGR. So, uh, yeah, anyone can build a brand new boat. There's no restrictions on that. The only uh, consideration is they have to be built to uh, production boat standard, uh, not custom one-off stripped-out GGR race boats, and uh, they have to be built to the original specifications that were offered at the time uh, back in you know, pre-1988. And it uh, looks like that's going to happen, so no big deal. Uh, because yes, some of the refits are costing substantial amounts of money and uh, others are costing very little money. It depends on the boat they buy. Uh, I understand barnacles can grow in, f in flesh. Uh, how do you protect themselves when cleaning the, uh, cleaning the hull? Oh, well, that's up to personal uh, protection. You know, if they're cleaning the hull, these, these goose barnacles are pretty innate in some ways. You can eat them and all the rest of it. So uh, the guys cleaning them in the, on the slip here or just pretty pretty well straight through it, just smash them off with good scrapers and then buff the hull back. And then they're all collected, bagged and burned. Uh, so uh, not such a big personal risk. Uh, will the new, will the new co wooden cold moulded Suhaili replica be allowed to enter the GGR? Yes. Um, there's a specific set of exclusions for anyone building a replica of Suhaili. It can be steel, aluminium, wood, fiberglass. There'll obviously be a one-off. Um, it's not a problem. As long as they're built as true replicas to the original design, uh, it can be any medium whatsoever. And we monitor very closely, uh, looking for any performance modifications and so on. That's not allowed. Uh, so the one that Mike Smith's doing in, in Australia is fantastic. And in fact, it'll be a hot boat, uh, no question. He's a good sailor. Uh, he's, he's, do, he's building an amazing boat, and uh, it is uh, meeting all the requirements for the GGR. That was from Joanne. Uh, Richard Kerrett, the, the way things are going, it looks like any finisher could end up on the podium. That's always the case. People are starting to realise that the GGR is a race of attrition. Nine in the first edition, one finisher. Uh, 18 second edition, five finishers. How many finishers will we have? We don't know because it's a long way to the finish. Uh, more than anything, it brings home that this is more than a race. Uh, any fisher, finisher is a winner, an extreme challenge. 75% of the entrants have retired, all very experienced sailors with a third distance uh, still remaining, or inspiring stuff to say the least. Uh, it does mean that wind waves have been a primary retirement problem for a number of retirees. Must be something else trying to get some sleep rudderless uh, in the Southern Ocean storm. Sorry, not a question, but more than appreciation of the special breed of sailors. You know, the GGR is about three things. In fact, probably, maybe even four. It's about preparation, planning, and execution. And every entrant will make their own take on that and how they actually do it. And that directly affects the end result of what's going on with one additional factor. And that's the mind game. The mind is the most important, powerful thing for the GDR. If you're not there for the right reasons, you'll never finish. There's always a reason to retire. It could be the smallest thing. So, oh, that's it. I've had enough, you know. Or... If you're there and you've got to finish, you'll take it to the end game. And what that end game is still varies. It's, it's a long way to the finish and things can still go wrong. So uh, that was from Richard. Not really a question, but there you go. Uh, Rick Johnson. Hi, Don again. What would happen if all the boats had to go down a class, into Chichester class, I think he means? Would there be a winner? Actually, I think uh, they who race are all winners. You're a winner too, Don. Well, you know, that's exactly right. I mean, at the end of the day... 
the word winner is a is a funny thing, you know. No one, you know, people aren't there to be a winner. Some are in the in the context of a race, but most are there for the adventure. And you're a winner when you cross the, the start line. You're a winner, no matter what happens. If that was your ultimate goal and ultimate dream to do it, it's very tough. If we ended up with all the boats in Chichester class, there would not be a winner of the GGR that year. Uh, or any of the Chichester a technical winner, you know, to take the trophies. Chichester entrants are not in the rankings for the race, so that would be a reality. But every Chichester finisher has completed an amazing adventure, so they're winners in their own right, and they would be seriously celebrated. You know, there's no difference really, other than one stop and a huge adventure. So, so uh, plenty of accolades all round. You know, but yeah, there wouldn't be a winner if everyone was in Chichester class. Um, Okay, uh, that was uh, so. Simona, I know they cannot get help from land or other boats, but can the entrants help each other? I like Kirsten gave some water to Ab. Uh, like, can Kirsten give water to Abolish if she is not, if she has a lot and he is not? Thanks. It's an interesting thing that hasn't come up, but the the the, the context of to to win the GGR, you have to be part of a solo, uh, unassisted, non-stop voyage around the world. If you take assistance from anyone at sea, physical assistance, then you would lose that uh, unassisted ranking, and uh, it wouldn't be, uh, uh, it wouldn't, you know, fit the criteria to be classed as a, uh, a you know, a, a winner in the GGR. So that's the reality. Certainly, in a serious situation, you're not going to let them starve. You do it, but then uh, Kirsten, if she was giving water to Avalish, uh, she wouldn't be affected because she can give things off the boat if she wants to. Uh, but Abolish would have to consider whether he wanted to accept that water. And again, that comes down to planning, preparation, and execution. It would have meant that Abolish didn't take enough water or make enough provision to catch water when he left Lasab de Lone. Uh, it sounds cruel and harsh, and I'm certainly not criticising anyone. I'm just saying that's the reality of the game. Some of the entrants left with 450 litres of water. Others left with a couple of hundred litres. So you can see there's a difference in planning and preparation there. And uh, that's the key to, to, to doing the GDR. Um, uh, for another one from Johan, the Toshiba 36 is built of epoxy resins. I thought that was not allowed. No, in fact, the hull is a, a glass hull and the, and the decks are glass plywood. And we assess that, they're a strong, solid boat. Uh, they're a full production boat. And so we allow the uh, uh, Cape George, uh, on the Toshiba 36, okay, well, Cape George 36 is like that. The Toshiba 36 is a full, um, uh, full glass moulded you know, production boat. So uh, some may have had uh, teak decks and, and ply glass decks and so on, but, and then a moulded centre cabin line. But those little anomalies we're not worried about. You know, they had heaps of those built, boats built, so they're a full production boat. Um, number two, so nobody has yet completed the whole GGR without a wind vane. Why would you even try? <laughs> so yes, you're right. No one's ever attempted to sail around the world solo non-stop without at least starting with a wind vane. Uh, Sue Haley and Robin lost his wind vane uh, uh, very quickly entering the Indian Ocean and effectively sailed the rest of the way around the world without any wind vanes at all. And the boat lended itself well for that, a very heavy displacement, you know, long keel, catch rig, you know, with big bowsprit and, and many different sails at the front so he can adjust the pressure on the boat fore and aft and did an amazing job. You know, so many other people would have just said, give up, bang, gone, I've gone home, you know. <laughs> so uh, Robin is an exceptional case, but yeah, no one's ever tried it without a wind vane, other than in high performance races where they're using electric autopilots. Plenty have done that, you know, even myself, you know. Um, so where autopilots are the, the best way to perform, so to speak. Um, okay, Rufus, what instruments are they carrying that differ from the first GGR? Uh, the first GGR, as in 1968, had very little. The second GGR in 2018, we had a whole array of uh, bits and pieces, but not performance electronics. It was all safety electronics and things like that, you know, AIS transponders and alarms and radar detectors and... Uh, uh, things like that. So the only difference really in this edition, the only extra we said was that we require two AIS devices. One is the AIS alarm. So any AIS hitting the boat, there's an alarm goes off to alert the skipper there's an AIS out there, so it might be a ship. And the other one now we've made the AIS transponders compulsory. And the transponder is basically like a normal traditional AIS, but you don't have a screen on the boat. You, it Wi-Fi's to your iPhone. So you set up all the data on your iPhone before the start of the race and then you leave the iPhone home. So the transponder is giving all of your data to any ships coming along. They see who you are, where you are. It's got a GPS in it hidden, but the, the entrance cannot see any of that. 
Um, they can also carry with effects now as well. You know, that's voluntary. It's not compulsory. And, uh, uh, you know, that's really about it. Um, okay, Greg. How would the GGR proceed if all remaining skippers were in just a class? We've explained that it would proceed, but there wouldn't be a winner of the GGR, a technical winner to take the trophy, which is a perpetual trophy. Um, could you please explain, uh, from Vivian, could you explain, please explain why Ian and Puffin aren't planning to go to Hobart? Well, Ian actually came to Hobart and he's already gone, come and gone, so he met the criteria. He's our uh, uh, last full GGR entrant at the moment. And, uh, uh, but, he, but Ian... Uh, so that's Ian, and uh, Ian and Puffin. That's it. Yeah, he, he called in here. So um, please wait. Why Ian and Puffin aren't coming? Yeah, they're come and gone. So I'm not sure what that one was. But anyway, Peter, can you explain how the fuel use adjustments apply at the end of the race? I know there's a limit on the volume, but do you gain or lose time based on the amount of fuel left and used? It's pretty simple. Uh, basically. Uh, any every entrant gets 25 litres of free fuel. That allows them to run their engine every week to make sure it's working, and if needed in an emergency, they can use it. Okay. Anything after that 25 litres, it costs them. Uh, uh, oh, jeepers! Now I think three hours for every litre of fuel. It might be two. I think it's three. <laughs> I need to check the notes of the race. It's three hours of uh, uh, time for every litre of fuel. I think <laughs> too much in my head. So and what we do is when they leave the Saab de Lone, uh, it's up to them to fill their tanks top, uh, absolute top. Right? We don't do it. We just say, fill your tanks up because you're going to get measured at the end. Uh, they have to motor to the start. That's why they motor out the river and then they turn their engines off and started sailing straight away to save fuel. And when they return, there's a tow there so they don't have to motor after they cross the finish line. They could be completely flat if they wanted to or they don't have to use their fuel. We'll tow them into the port. And the first thing that happens is we take them to the fuel dock. Their finishing time is provisional until we top up their tanks. And if we put 22 litres of fuel in the tank, that finishing time is real. If we put uh, 125 litres of fuel in their tank, they have 100 litres of fuel use, so that's 300 hours that gets added to their finishing time. So 300 hours is quite a long time. And so if they finished... Uh, uh, in 210 days and we've got to give them 10 days of time penalty uh, for fuel use, then their official finishing time will be 300, uh, 220 days, not 210 days. And that stacks up in the rankings to work out their position in the race. So uh, it's quite a severe time penalty uh, for fuel use and that's to encourage alternate energy and not to get them to rely on uh, using hydrocarbons. Um, we need the hydrocarbons on the boat in case we need to direct someone to assist in a rescue or uh, in case they get into trouble, you know, if they get dismasted or something, they need their engine to use it. And that's why we leave them because uh, we can't allow electric engines and it's not powerful enough. You can't carry enough energy, you know, solar panels might be there, batteries, blah, blah, blah. So it's a safety reason for us to require the engines and to require their fuel on board, but we don't want them to use it. So uh, that's how that works. Uh, Warren, I think uh, I think should have posted this here. Okay, yeah. Uh, Don, just wondering about your thoughts on the Ocean Race, which will be bringing their faster mochas through this area later in about one or two months. Not sure. Uh, they will hit some extra weather issues, uh, I expect. Uh, yeah, they'll get the whole gambit, you know, but they're moving really fast, and that gives them the unique ability to miss all the heavy weather. They can just steer around it and go wherever they want. So uh, they're looking for... Flat water, foiling conditions, you know, to keep keep driving hard. And um, they'll sail through the fleet for sure. They'll they'll be there. They're heading to Cape Town now. They'll be around Cape Horn in, you know, in another month or so uh, when our boats are there. They're moving so fast. And it's all pretty exciting. So they have the, the latest and greatest weather routing or computer models. You'll see most of them will be moving in similar tracks because they're using similar programs. It's the computer that tells them where to go, not the skipper. The skipper decides on the choice. They'll put options up and, and he'll say, let's go that one. And so they go that one. But most of them will pick that one because it gives the best result based on all the satellite regular data coming in and all that sort of stuff. So it's a completely different ballgame. It's very exciting to watch. And, um, you know, there's pretty good coverage. 
uh, I kind of enjoy it because it's like, whoa, <laughs> but it's it's a different cup of tea. So uh, good luck to them. They're having a great time. And, and it's in, it's really good that everything got up, you know. There was a lot of discussion about the, the ocean race. Would it go? Would it, wouldn't it go? And they've really cracked it. They've got five entrants in the race. And uh, and I think, um, you know, that's, that's good for the future. So uh, good fun. Um Okay, Cliff, uh, I'd be interested to learn the techniques for reefing sailing downwind like this, Don. Okay, so reefing downwind is not as hard as you think if you've got the right systems. And the best systems are having a fully battened mainsail, okay, uh, with battened cars going up inside a track uh, or, or resting up against the, the trailing edge of the mast. And when you do that, even with the running downwind, you're better off having inline spreaders because if you've got swept back spreaders, it's a problem because you'll get... Uh, the main will be pressured up against it and it's very hard to run dead square. So so having inline spreaders, spreaders is a real plus. Having a boom which you can get up out of the water is a plus, plus when you're running downwind because when the boom's right out the side, when you want to start reefing, you know, you, as you're rolling, the boom's hitting the water and you don't want to do that because it can stress the fang points and bits and break the boom and stuff. We haven't seen a broken boom yet, uh, but they used to happen a lot in the good old days. Um, so all you're basically doing then is using slab reefing, you know, walking the whole thing down. And because you can, um, you know, get the, you have your topping lift on with the boom out, you can lower your halyard to a preset point. You know, you say putting one reef in, you'll have marks on your halyard, you know, run it through. I always do mine from the cockpit. Run it through loose and the, the sail sags. Then you've got your luff line, which is rolled over to a double. And you're just winching that in to pull the luff down flat. You're dragging it down the front of the mast. And even though there's pressure on the sail, Right, as long as you're not sheeted in and you've got the pressure off the leech, so so the leech of the sail is loose, it's sitting there. You're literally dragging it down in front of the in front of the the uh, cap and the lowers. You know, you just drag it down, get your get your luff line really tight, okay, get it nice and tight to to pull the reef point in, and then just crank up your halyard. You know, just take it up a bit and and stretch out the luff. When you've done that, you're then in a position to just crank up on the on the leech. You know, you just get your leech line all from the cockpit again. You can lift the boom with your leech line, and then when you've got that done, it's pretty tidy, and you just sheet back in again. It, it's not uh, difficult at all. You know, you you know, I I never on my in my solo circumnavigation, fifty foot a big boom. Uh, I could always reef downwind, and you don't have to wait. You cannot round up. You cannot afford to round up in big seas uh, in the Southern Ocean because it puts the boat beam on and things like that. You have to do it. Keep going downhill. You know, um, but you do it early. Um, it's nice to get rid of your mainsail ahead of your head sails because you want to pull from the front when you're going downwind so i would always be i would always be one step down and have more head sail out i had uh, two furlers up the front and then a, a wire stay sail so you just balance that and pulling from the front is a big plus so it's um not too bad and i think uh, most of the entrants have got batten cars and fully batten main sails and are doing just that you know um okay so uh and James, I'm curious if ultrasonic anti-fouling devices would be allowed in future GGRs. They're already allowed. Ayrton uh, Biscardi's had an electronic uh, 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 assistance for fouling on his hull. He cleared it with me, you know, said, hey, can I fit this? And so that's an environmental issue. I like the idea. You can fit that. It helps. So go for it. So he did, as well as normal anti-fouling, you know. So uh, there's no problem. You know, we use common sense on that. If someone wants to run an electronic fouling system to... And they can keep it running, you know, because it's electrically driven and, and it's pretty tough in the Southern Ocean. Uh, we have no problem with that. Um, even though it's high tech, it's for environmental purposes. Maybe it gives an advantage, but it's not TBT. So uh, we approve that uh, after consideration and looking at the options. Um, I know it's not 1968 technology, but the 68 TBT paints were common. In 2023, TBA paints are almost completely banned. No, they are completely banned. You've got to have special exemption to use TBT, like co huge commercial ships and so on. And, and a reminder, we have samples of all of the, the paints on the bottom of the GGR boats, and we can test them at any time for TBT. Uh, I don't remember any of the entrance 68 race... Um, having barnacle issues and it seems in 2018 22 editions is a major deciding factor it absolutely is and i i've got a feeling that all of the entrants in 2026 are going to really be thinking long and hard about it i think it sort of slipped away a bit from people's minds you know it was a big issue in 2018 and people just sort of i think there was a general consensus they sort of forgot about it a bit they didn't really no one really 
I didn't see anyone talking about and giving huge focus on the idea that, oh, we might have a barnacle problem here. We've got to get really serious. It was just doing the usual stuff. Honestly, I was, and even I was a bit relaxed as well. I said, oh, cheapers, the barnacles are coming back. It was a real surprise. So, so yes, but remember, planning, preparation, execution, uh, kind of interesting. So uh, I'm sure it's going to be a discussion point, and I'm sure some of the other around-the-world races are watching as well, but the GGR is unique in that it's so slow, you know, so... Um, that's uh, you know, a lot of issues there. Okay, uh, have we set a date for the uh, English interview with Tapio? Yes, we have. The date is going to be Tuesday, uh, Tuesday European time, so in a few days. Well, I'm just waiting for, the, I've given Tapio the option now to pick the final time. He's got a whole band of people coming in on this, uh, experts of a very high caliber, to talk about a lot of the technical issues that, that may or may not have been involved. So if you've got the slightest interest in this one, I think you'll you'll uh, want to tune into that. And um, yeah, we'll be working on European time, and, and it's it's happening right now. So we had a few I had a few issues here and still ongoing, but uh, I finally confirmed everything. I'm now officially trapped in Tasmania. I can't get back to Europe. That's another another long story. Um, and uh, uh, but we're going to do it from here, and we're clear to do it on Tuesday. So uh, uh, watch out for that one. That'll be fun. Looking forward to it. Uh, since GGR considers a wind vane safety equipment, this is from James, uh, uh, it is, is it worth considering added a tiller pilot to the equipment that is sealed in a case for snafu, you know, emergencies? Also, have the wind vane manufacturers requested details of the failures of their products so they can improve? So first of all, uh, any of the entrants can have a, um, uh, an emergency uh, tiller pilot on board. Uh, that's in the rules, but it's sealed in a bag. So if they want to use it, they can. It's an option. It's not a requirement. In, we're discussing this right now. There will be some more changes to the notice of race in 2026. Uh, one will be that you either carry uh, substantial spares to completely rebuild your wind vane, or you must have a uh, competent uh, uh, tiller pilot, uh, not the smallest, cheapest, simplest one. It's got to be a competent one that will manage the boat in moderate conditions, uh, sealed and secured on board. It'll become mandatory. Uh, it's kind of unique. Normally, you, it wouldn't have been an issue, but Simon's point, you know, Simon's situation now has shown us that you can get a boat in a bad situation where you, you, uh, you know, that's the worst place in the world to happen what he's happened. He's fine, he's safe, he's all under control, and he's very comfortable with it. But um, he'll be approaching a lee shore, and uh, you, you know, having a, a pilot is now a, an electric autopilot backup is. Uh, uh, a real safety of value, okay? So it's going to be mandatory if they don't decide not to carry uh, either a second wind vane or major components to rebuild uh, the majority of the wind vane to so and that might be done to save weight. You know, once again, uh, you look at a boat like, you can see the difference in preparation of boats, you know, planning, preparation, execution. There's different reasons to, for entrants to prepare their boats the way they do. Some want maximum performance, some want maximum reliability, some want maximum fun. And so uh, I, we dread the thought of putting too much controls on the boats because you don't want all the boats to be exactly the same and you don't want to say you have to do this, you have to do that. But as soon as we see something, a safety issue, then then it becomes a bit more than an option and, and, it, and it is a realistic expectation that you should have enough spares on board to repair your wind vane. And if you don't, then we're going to require, um, if you can't show you've got that, then we're going to require that you you must have, instead of being optional, you must have the electric emergency tiller pilot. Um, so uh, and then on the, the case of the uh, uh, case of the... Um, the manufacturers are requesting information and stuff. They don't need to because we do it anyway. You'll see on every situation, we do a detailed report on what's happening. We ask the entrants to be fair and honest with us on the experiences that they've had. And uh, we report on that because yes, we do take it quite seriously. Uh, Simon's uh, situation is another unique one. Uh, we've already spoken to the manufacturer about that. And uh, that damage has only ever happened on a marina before. So. <laughs> That's the situation. Uh, but now it's real, and uh, we will do a report on that, and we'll assess that at the time and and uh, talk about it and look at what's happening. But unfortunately, Simon doesn't have any spares. If he had the spares, it would be an easy fix, but uh, that's not the case. So, so yes, we do take it seriously, and and uh, but none of the other... You know, there's only Aries and uh, Wind Pilot there. Uh, Abolish has had some issues with his Wind Pilot. Uh, some we know about, some we don't know about yet, but we'll find out at the end of the race. And uh, the Aries, uh, simple little problems, you know, but uh, 
uh, on one, uh, so with no more Aries in the race. Hydrovane's chosen because of the selection of the entrance. It's got nothing to do with sponsors or anything like that. It's the entrance themselves making the decisions on uh, what type of vein they want and why they're using it. And there's very distinct reasons for that as well. Some of the rudders inside the boats are a long way from the back of the boat. And it doesn't matter if you've got a pendulum system, uh, you're still using the ship's rudder. If you want another rudder right at the back to increase performance, that's a legitimate reason as well. And historically in cruising situations, that's another reason why hydrovane is, is popular on many of the traditional boats because the, it puts a rudder right at the back of the boat. You've got an emergency rudder, blah, blah, blah. There's nothing wrong with the servo pendulum systems, um, particularly like on a rustler because you've got the rudder at the back of the boat already. So you're looking at driving the rudder in an efficient way. And a uh, pendulum system is a lot lighter, a lot simpler driving through the main rudder. But there's all these things that come to play. And, and uh, uh, But for us, as the organiser, the wind vanes are absolutely safety equipment. So, um, okay. Um, peeps, uh, hello, Don. I know you should have always... I know that one should always expect the worst. And I guess when the race starts, everyone knows that the main point is to finish... I cannot avoid, as it goes on, to feel sadness for all those hopes dashed for the retiring sailors. Today, after the latest incident with Simon, I wonder how you feel, and does, does these events affect you for the planning of the next uh, edition of the GGR? You know, the, the GGR, you know, I'm the first, we, we know the GGR really well, and I think people are starting to understand now that it is completely unique because of the, 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 the various levels of challenges and obstacles that, anyone has to overcome to get to the finish okay there's nothing like it anywhere at a personal level at a sporting level at a technical level uh, it's it's just crazy and uh, that's the beauty of the ggr so i'm not uh, seeing anything at the moment that that is going to make us want to change either the ethos or the concept of the race or anything it is what it is it'll stand forever and uh, it's tough and it's only for the 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 those that are that are crazy enough to want to do it and uh, that was the case in two th in 1968 it was the case in 2018 it's the case in 2022 and i've got to tell you it's going to be the same in 26 we have a huge amount of interest at the moment there is no room for russell 37s anymore in the race we've already filled seven uh now we're running the risk as over there could be seven cape george 36s in the next race so so there's a lot of people talking about 26 and i think the tougher the challenge gets and the more diverse and and uh, interesting it gets the more attraction it has for people the race has risk um and it is serious but it has its own appeal now and more and more people are understanding it there's a lot of people that hate it, right? A lot of people think we're all crazy and we're out in any stupid, dangerous little boats and blah, you crazy, blah. But there's a lot of people that are getting a lot out of it. And uh, and that, uh, to us, means that it's working. So, um, uh, you know, there's there's not a lot of changes. You know, there's, there's nothing really new with the ethos and the concept. It'll always stay the same. In fact, uh, when something ain't broke, don't change it. And um, it's not for everyone, but... Uh, it's pretty cool. <laughs> anyway, is Simon uh, from T? Is Simon carrying a uh, tiller pilot? No, he's not carrying a tiller pilot. Um, from James, I wonder if anyone of these carrying something like this on board for clearing thing. There's a power tool with a wobbly blade that you scrape along. It's battery powered. We do allow battery powered tools for um, uh, for safety reasons. You know, drills and grinders and things like that. Um, but I don't know whether anyone will get, take one of those to jump under the water with an electric power tool to scrape barnacles off. There's so many issues about scraping barnacles, the boat movement and holding your breath and all those sorts of things that, um, you know, it's a personal choice. Anyway, that's about it. We've done the questions and uh, everything's looking good. Uh, Simon's out trialling his uh, best way to steer at the moment and uh, we'll keep you updated on that as it's happening and uh, see you later on tonight uh, with the tracker. Thanks for that.